International political economy is the study of the interaction of international relations, typically international organizations, and economics, and primarily interstate trade and investment and its impact on both economic development and peace. Robert Gilpin classifies international political economy into three categories. Mercantilism, which is an equivalent of realism, liberalism, and Marxism. Liberal political economic thought has its origins in the Enlightenment. It is espoused most vocally by Adam Smith, the author of The Wealth of Nations, and in France by Montesquieu and the Manchester Liberals, who argued that the effect of states trading between each other tended to lead to peace. The basic argument is that trade obtains wealth more easily than war, essentially because you're not paying for the cost of the conflict. And two, Trade converts states from systems run by militarists, and these can be monarchs with a military inclination, to systems run by middle classes, because it makes merchants wealthy, and enough of the merchants wealthy that they become a politically important middle class. And ultimately, it would make the masses wealthy and divert the attention from activities focused on war. This is the arguments made by Comte and Spencer. So the definition. Liberalism is a doctrine for organizing and managing a market economy in order to achieve maximum efficiency, economic growth, and individual welfare. Therefore, the three main assumptions of liberalism as applied to trade and peace are, one, it separates the pursuit of territory from the pursuit of wealth. If wealth is based on trade, there's also no point in conquering territory. Number two, market forces are both more efficient and by replacing governments, they depoliticize the pursuit of wealth. Three, free trade creates interdependence, which is a disincentive to the use of force between states. Wars destroy trade, they destroy business, wealth, factories, they destroy the delicate system of commerce. Wars increase debt, taxes, and government spending. Wars kill skilled people. The liberal logic of the market. For liberals, the essential focus is on the benefits of the market to the state and the consumer. Markets rise spontaneously in response to needs, and once in operation, they operate according to their own set of logics. Liberals are committed to the price mechanism of the market, which is governed by the law of supply and demand, as the most efficient way of organizing domestic and international relations. The law of supply and demand argues that a self-correcting equilibrium of cost will be arrived at based on the consumer's and producer's goal of maximizing gain. In the process of supply and demand, consumers and producers are sensitive to prices and so adjust their terms of exchange accordingly. The fundamental unit for liberals is the individual consumer or household. Both behave rationally in an attempt to maximize their return, but seeking the greatest gain at the lowest cost. Individuals pursue their goals in a world of scarcity. The market is believed to generate productive growth through competition. Markets are more efficient than any other form of organization. And underlying this whole logic, liberals believe in progress. The logic of politics in liberalism. Liberalism is committed to a free market and minimal state intervention. 
It's committed to individual equality and liberty. Because the individual household or individual in the market needs to be free to decide what they will buy. For liberals, market exchanges are free. The liberal logic of trade and peace. Liberalism argues that trade leads to peace because long-term harmony will supersede any temporary or local conflict. Richard Cobden and John Stuart Mill argued that free trade brings harmony of interests because it separates the pursuit of wealth from the pursuit of territory, thereby making it unnecessary to conquer foreign sources of raw materials or finished goods. Trade is cheaper because it is cheaper than war or the occupation of an unwilling society. As well, trade permitted states to specialize in a trade of those goods they were best at producing and receiving in turn inexpensive products from other states with similar specialization. This form of comparative, comparative advantage made all participating states better off because it pushed product prices down. The theory of comparative advantage argues that interstate trade brings benefits because it permits states to specialize in activities for which they are predisposed, and this increases their overall efficiency. The classic example is offered by the economist Ricardo. He gave the illustration of the English exporting wool to Portugal in exchange for the Portuguese exporting their wine to England. The alternative would be for the English to produce their own wine and for the Portuguese to produce their own wool. In both cases, the English wine would be of lower quality and lower quantity and higher cost. And Portuguese wool would be of lower quality, lower quantity and higher cost. And so both the Portuguese and the English benefit by engaging in trade. It's a positive sum game. Everybody wins. Therefore, wealth is more easily obtained through trade than war. When war is cheaper or easier, it is pursued instead. Trade reduces the likelihood of war by structurally altering the societies that engage in trade. Trade creates a middle class that resists involvement in war more strongly than other domestic socioeconomic distributions. Capitalism and free trade increase individual liberty and help promote democracy, which in turn promotes the rule of law and international cooperation, which further facilitates international trade. Now, the critique of liberalism. Number one, liberals separate economics from its institutional and political bases. Property rights is a value that must be normatively internalized within a society's economic culture before it can be exploited. Liberals tend to believe that institutions change slowly, which is not always the case. Karl Polanyi argued that markets are sustained by a consensus of values. Their absence is not a free market, but economic anarchy. If the system were based solely on individual interests, society would collapse. In other words, if you examine the history of economic markets, you will observe a significant amount of order that is more often than not based on political institutions that protect it and sustain it. Because as we will see in a few moments, markets are inherently dysfunctional. They require regulation. Number two, international free trade has never existed without a naval hegemony paying the costs of the system and defending the high seas. The Portuguese, Dutch, English, or the US fleets. 
In fact, a number of theorists blame the Great Depression of 1930 on the fact that the United Kingdom was too weak to be hegemon and the US was not ready domestically to be a hegemon. So international liberalism depends on a hegemony funded navy. Today, for example, the world's oceans are protected by the United States Navy. But it was not always so. 500 years ago, the Europeans created the global economy by defeating pirates and coercing countries to permit access to their trade. Number three, economic interdependence is never symmetrical. In other words, a two-way trade is never perfectly fair for both trading partners. Liberalism promises absolute returns for all participants in the market, but does not pay any attention to the importance of relative gains between states. States are fearful not only of poverty, but of becoming weaker over time. Relative gains matters because a state may become powerful enough to seize any absolute benefits that were gained. The distinction is that a leader concerned with relative gains would prefer to be poor yet powerful than wealthy and vulnerable. And for that reason, many states maintain high trade barriers because they're afraid of the impact of trade with a larger neighbor. Pakistan, for example, maintains very high tariffs against Indian exports. And for that reason, there is very little trade between India and Pakistan. Pakistan is fearful that India would end up dominating Pakistan's economy because India's got seven times the population. In the same way that India has come to dominate Bangladesh's economy. In fact, Bangladesh's economy is so completely tied to India's that many of the goods that go in and out of Bangladesh through trade actually pass through the Indian port of Calicut and not the Bangladeshi port of Dhaka, the capital. An example of what liberal trade can do is the British colonial experience in India. In order for the English industrialists who are manufacturing huge quantities of textiles like clothing to get a profit, they needed to sell to a market and India was the market. When India was independent, they put restrictions and they put tariffs and taxes to limit the amount of goods being dumped onto the market. But once the British conquered India, they were able to remove all those barriers and dump cheap clothing on the Indian market. And this destroyed Indian industry. It destroyed the clothing manufacturing uh, it even undermined Indian's, India's steel industry. Uh, in the 18th century, India produced more steel than England. So a completely exposed market becomes vulnerable to waves of cheaper goods that then destroy the native industries. Number four. For liberals, the state is supposed to be non-interventionist, except where public goods are involved. For example, 40% of vegetables on trains in the Soviet Union were allowed to rot because of the lack of a market incentive. So central planning in socialist states was most often a terrible failure. It's one of the reasons why China shifted to capitalism in order to accelerate growth. However, states are needed to offset the two dysfunctions or market failures that persist in markets. The first market failure can come in the form of a collapse, a depression. Business cycles are completely normal. You have periods in which the economy is doing well when the sellers and buyers are well matched and then you get either too much competition, which undermines investment, or other dysfunctions occur where the buyers and sellers are not well aligned, and then the economy begins to slow down. And then eventually it picks up again, and this is a constant cycle. 
under Keynesianism, it is recommended that in periods where the economy is doing poorly, that the state intervene and then provide public funding to encourage the economy to, a, to return to prosperity. The second form of market failure can come as monopolization. Companies use their superior size to undersell competitors, put them out of business, and once all competition has been rendered bankrupt, they raise prices to maximize profits through economies of scale. Depicted here are some of the wealthiest business owners that have ever lived. These are not your friends. They all have an aggressive tendency towards monopolization. There are, of course, the five familiar individuals that you can see in the top right. Uh, they don't match the wealth of the, some of the wealthiest men in history. You've got in the bottom, on the left, Mansa Musa, who old, owned a gold mine in Western Africa, who, when he dumped the gold on the market, it led to inflation. On the top, you have in the center of the Rothschild, who loaned money to monarchs in Europe. And then you've got, uh, wearing the red, uh, the Medici, who were important bankers of Florence. And in the top left, you have Dale Carnegie, who is far wealthier than all five of the individuals on the top right added together. He was in steel, and he owned more than 1% of the entire US economy. And it took a great effort by the Attorney General, despite all the corruption in the US government, to apply antitrust legislation and break up his companies. But all of these indigu individuals pale in comparison to the individual on the bottom right. The German mining family of the Fugers based in Augsburg. At one point, they controlled 1.5% of the entire economy of Europe, which made them the wealthiest family in human history. And they were heavily involved in politics. They bankrolled most of the Holy Roman Emperors who used the money to bribe the electors to get elected, and then gave mining concessions in Europe and outside of Europe to the Fugers. All of these individuals want to become monopolists and raise prices and make life intolerable for consumers. The true heroes are not these people. They are the antitrust regulators who remain invisible, poorly paid, susceptible to corruption, who block monopoly. Number five. However, state non-intervention is at the cost of social equality. Liberalism tends to disregard the impact of social inequity. Not everyone gains equally in a market. Participants gain according to their contribution in a perfect market. In an imperfect market, distortions may benefit some and penalize others for their participation. Number six. Liberals assume complete information, but in fact, there are great transaction costs at work in the marketplace. Individuals are not rational actors, and there is no complete information. Economists tend to defend these assumptions by arguing that inefficient consumers are selected out. But what does that mean? They don't disappear. They're still there. They're simply poor. Number seven. Liberals assume technological growth. Economic growth is a recent phenomenon, and we have some minimal control over it. In the past, there were periods of collapse, such, the, such as the period in the West after the fall of the Roman Empire, and the Bronze Age collapse of around 1100 before Common Era. Let us now examine the second approach of political economy, mercantilism. It has its origins in trade in Western Europe. 
It basically was the practice of the early modern period with the early emergence of states. In its contemporary form, it's called economic nationalism. It argues that in the process of state building, economics is subordinated to the imperatives of state power. In other words, economics is not a free market. It's something the state uses to make itself strong. So in classical or financial mercantilism, there's a focus on trade and investment. In effect, business people who often were in the legislature and the government would influence policy to use the Navy to support their investment interests abroad. Industrial mercantilism emerged in the 19th century. And although industrialization didn't simply occur in the 19th century, it had a history of several centuries leading up to it. There was an explosion in machine manufacturing in the 19th century. So the essential position of mercantilism is that economic, economic activities are and should be subordinated to state interests. We can see this with key industries. The United States, for example, prohibits foreign investment in industries that are considered vital to national security, including special material fabrication. Mercantilists are also preoccupied with autarky or economic self-sufficiency. Japan is very concerned about food self-sufficiency. And so there are very high tariffs in Japan that discourage foreign imports. And although Japanese pay higher prices for food, Japan feels itself insulated from the shock of suddenly having the food supply cut off because of, for example, a war or a blockade. The state is the most important organization in the international system and national security and by extension the accumulation of power is its principal activity. The current market system tends to concentrate wealth in some states and this can lead to dependency relations and even an international hierarchy. Adam Smith argued that everyone wants to be a monopolist. Mercantilism can be offensive states capturing sources of wealth in order to get positive trade balances with other trade competitors all the time trying to maintain autarky but it can also be defensive states protecting their workers and their citizens by raising tariff barriers to ensure that the jobs of its citizens are protected and to ensure that the state has the food and the material goods necessary to maintain a good quality of life for its citizens Mercantilists prefer a positive balance of trade. That means that the value of goods being exported and sold brings more value than those goods that are being purchased and imported. Mercantilists also focus on industry as the basis for power. They oppose deindustrialization and the growth of services, which is what occurred in many Western countries in the 1980s. They give the example of Bahrain, which used to have oil, but then ran out and subsequently moved into banking. And while Bahrain is still quite well off, there are long-term consequences of losing industry, which is becoming dependent on foreign countries that have lower labor costs. Nationalists believe that industry has spillover effects to the rest of the economy such as social mobilization and education that increases the power of the state. Some states attempt to obtain both. This is what a Japan is accused of. It has access to the international system of free trade in order to make exports it needs to obtain resources while simultaneously protecting its own domestic market from foreign imports. And it does this not only with tariffs, which are actually quite low, but with invisible barriers barriers that are related to health regulations and also the tendency of Japanese people to prefer domestic goods rather than foreign exports. Mercantilist policies often occur in declining economies and is manifested by protectionism, essentially high tariffs to block imports, and it may occur in developing states in which attention is paid to protecting emerging industries. 
Protectionism is often advocated by mercantilists, and this puts it in opposition to free trade liberals. Welfare mercantilism by the welfare state is done to protect the citizens from external competition. Now, many states base their free trade policies within a context of mercantilism, and this is termed the strategic use of trade to obtain greater relative gains. So the state is neither a free trader nor completely protected. It chooses a middle ground which optimizes both its wealth and its autarkic industries. The principal implication is that free trade is not really free trade. Rather, it's a method of obtaining monopolization by the hegemon, the largest commercial power in the international system, and therefore to affect the structure of trade so that the hegemon obtains a favorable term of exchange between its imports and its exports. Mercantilists are preoccupied with accumulating the resources necessary for war. Mercantilism explains why states do not rely on the free market, but engage in industrial policies to ensure that the manufacturing base of the country remains strong. They seek to corner oil supplies and uranium and phosphate producing regions important for fertilizers for farming. In the context of early United States history, whereas Thomas Jefferson believed in free trade and commerce, Alexander Hamilton sought state support for manufacturing through import substitution industrialization or ISI, where infant industries are protected by high tariffs and restrictions against the export of strategic raw materials. Friedrich Licht was the U.S. ambassador to the German principalities, but he was actually a German nationalist in exile. His strong mercantilist views shaped German foreign policy in the First and the Second World Wars. He sought free trade within Germany, called the Zollverein, but he resisted free trade believing that Germany would be dominated economically by its neighbors. Now, the critiques of mercantilism. Mercantilism makes little analysis of foregone gains. The most powerful states today are those that cooperated through free trade. Autarky is therefore a very short-sighted strategy. Both as a doctrine and descriptively, Mercantilism undervalues the importance of alliances and of positive sum economic relations. Mercantilists assume that economic relations are zero sum. Your loss is my gain and my gain is your loss. But in fact, states can ally together economically, making them stronger together so that they can oppose a third party threat. In fact, almost all the powerful, successful states were dependent on international trade. Holland, the UK, the US, the autarky of the mercantilists is therefore empirically unfounded. Here you can see the port of Montreal. Now Montreal was actually never uh, oriented towards mercantilism. Lord Beaverbrook, who was a Canadian who'd moved to England and gotten involved in politics, he owned uh, a very important newspaper to influence politics, tried throughout his career to obtain a free trade agreement between England and Canada. But the English consistently refused because they were uh, likely concerned about the competition from Canada. Number two, protectionism may actually decrease power if it encourages inefficiency, as may occur with an interventionist state. The transaction costs may be greater for a state than for a market. The third approach to international political economy is Marxism. Based mainly on the works of Karl Marx and his advocacy and his most important book, Das Kapital. For Marxism, capitalism is the private ownership of the means of production and the existence of wage labor. Capitalists strive for profit and capital accumulation in a competitive market. Labor has been dispossessed of its land and is a commodity that is subject to price mechanisms. In other words, wage labor goes up and down. 
Marxists argue that although individuals in the market are rational, the market itself is irrational and prone to failure. Here you can see Friedrich Engels who collaborated with Karl Marx on the Communist Manifesto. So there are four underlying mechanisms that are dysfunctional in capitalism. Number one, the law of disproportionality. This rejects Say's law, which holds that supply creates its own demand, so that supply and demand will always be, except for brief moments, in balance. The law of disproportionality rejects this. It rejects the equilibrating mechanism that makes market overproduction impossible. Marx argued instead that this mechanism against overproduction does not exist, and so there are periods where supply and demand do not match. There is thus a cyclically recurring period of depression and crisis that would eventually lead the proletariat, who are the wage labor in capitalism, into revolution against the owners of the means of production. Number two, the law of concentration of capital, also known as the law of the accumulation of capital. Competition in the capitalist market compels investors to increase their efficiency in order to survive, and so they strive to accumulate capital. This leads to an ever-increasing concentration of capital in the hands of a few as the weaker capitalists are selected out of the system. The impoverished capitalists then join the ranks of the proletariat, and this makes revolution more likely. Number three, the law of the falling rate of profit. As capitalism accumulates and becomes more abundant, the rate of return declines, thereby decreasing the incentive to invest. As the pressure of competition compels capitalists to increase efficiency and productivity, through investment in new labor-saving and more productive technology, the level of unemployment will increase and the rate of profit will decrease. This causes both a slowing in the economic growth rate and increases unemployment, both of which make revolution more likely. Now, Marx's predictions of world revolution were largely disconfirmed by the proletariat support for the nationalist conflict in 1914. Marx also could not explain how wages were rising just prior to the period of 1870 to 1914. There was an addendum made to the theory by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin in his 1917 book Imperialism. He argued that capitalism had escaped the three laws through overseas investment. Colonies had permitted the capitalist states to sell their surplus production obtain cheap resources and export their surplus capital. The economic surplus permitted the capitalists to buy off the proletariat leadership. States therefore had to export capital or stagnate. So Lenin also added a fourth law to Marx. Number four, the law of uneven growth. As capitalist economies mature, they seek colonies, and the share of colonies depends on their power. Therefore, the UK obtained the most colonies. However, as other great powers catch up, such as Germany, they demand a redivision of the colonies, and this leads to armed conflict among the great powers. Lenin believed this was the cause of the First World War. This leads to the export of capital from the state of origin in search of a higher rate of return. Marx believed that as the world was drawn into a single market, so that it was no longer possible to export capital, the falling rate of return on capital would lead to a stagnant system. For Lenin, stagnation would follow after the last great territory, China, was colonized by the Europeans, thereby exhausting the last area for capital export. In fact, China was never colonized, and European colonialism began its steady decline just prior. Lenin basically argued that capitalism created a system that inevitably led to war, and it even generates its own competitors because the export of capital and goods leads to the diffusion of technology, industry, capital, and military power that weakens the core 
capitalist states. It creates competitors with lower wage costs that are able to compete with the great powers in the international market. The Critique of Marxism Economic interdependence is not the most important factor in international relations. Strategic and nationalist issues typically matter more. The problem with Lenin's argument is that the major capitalist powers cooperated in their exploitation of the colonies. In 1884 and 1885 at the Berlin Conference, the European states without violence cooperated in the division of the colonies in Africa. The principal disputes were not in the colonies, but in Europe, specifically between France and Germany over Alsace and Lorraine. Nor can Lenin explain that the three most competitive imperial rivals, England, France, and Russia, were allies in the First World War. Lenin's own data shows that the bulk of investment and trade flows were directed to the most developed colonies. The English invested in Canada, Australia, the US, and South Africa, and Argentina, and not their own colonies, where the rate of return was too low. Also, in the period prior to the First World War, investment was directed by foreign policy, and foreign policy was not directed by economic interests. Here, for example, you can see where investment ended up in the lead-up to 1914. If you look, for example, at investment, which is purple, which is English, measured in millions of dollars, the British invested 535 million in Europe, 2.8 billion in Canada, 4.2 billion in the US, 700 million in Brazil, 200 million in Uruguay, 300 million in Argentina, 1.5 billion generally in South America, 1.5 billion in South Africa, 200 million in Egypt, 600 million in British East Africa, 1.8 billion in India, 600 million in China, 550 million in Russia, 500 million in Japan, 300 million in New Zealand, and 1.7 billion in Australia. So the British invested very little in Africa, very little in their Middle Eastern colonies. Most British investment went to America. If you look at where German investment went, most German investment went to America, $950 million worth. French investment mostly went to Russia, $2.4 billion worth. And only a small proportion went to French colonies. So Lenin was wrong. The colonies did not matter for economic purposes. They were not a motive for war or conflict. 